Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 380, the Friday edition, the St. Patrick's All Green edition. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And today is March 16th, 2018. We have gone four days without a nor'easter in Connecticut. It's a miracle. It's so happy. I saw some snow flurries today. Obviously, the weather down there is amazing. I did want to bring up and ask you, do you have any Irish in you at all? None whatsoever, Kevin. Huh. I married an Irish woman. It explains a lot. But I have no Irish in me as well. Uh, however, my heritage is from Norway. We kind of thought of uh, Ireland as kind of a weekend retreat. You know, place to invade, stay, tourist. You know how it goes. So uh, uh, she's going to want to go out tomorrow to an Irish bar somewhere and drink her, her green stuff. And I have to go because I love my wife. Let's move on a little bit to the news of the day. You know, we... um, after this filming, I think I'll get a green milkshake at our McDonald's yeah, down the street. Shamrock shakes are the only just, just aside, Susan, my wife, and I are so excited. We only have a McDonald's. We have three traffic lights, yep. McDonald's, and a shell station in our little town. They're building a Wendy's. And every month, I go, Susan stands in front of the construction, and she just can't wait. You know, Wendy's is much oh. better than McDonald's. Oh, but, you know, I mean, just just think of the high culture that we're now going to have with Wendy's. And maybe we'll get a subway. Awesome. Just in, in, in Olive Garden. That's next. Ooh, wow. No, I know. It's, it's amazing, you know, what's come along in the last 20 years for franchises. Uh, what were we talking about? Ah, the news. Okay, we didn't talk about it because it took a little while to confirm all the news and get all the bishops to that we talked to to say, yeah, that happened, yeah, that happened. But we're going to talk about the House of Bishops meeting at Camp Allen in Texas that happened a couple weeks ago. It's the last meeting before General Convention. Where's General Convention this year, Texas? It's in Austin, Texas. Ah, that makes sense. And talk about a little I'm bit. Polishing of... up my pointy boots and going to buy a hat and everything. <laughs> get a hat. Oh yeah, we got to get you a cheap hotel down there in 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 Austin. Nothing's cheap down there. That's a college town. That'd be fun. They may actually run into a conference center that's union, like they promised to always do. Right, we'll see. Okay, so the topic came up uh, day one or day two. Uh, should we be paying uh, Gay Jennings? Who is what's her title president of the house of deputies now back you know 20 years ago that was a, a nice volunteer job not a lot of work you, you do 50 years ago 200 years yeah, ago it's a gavel job you show up <coughs> i call this meeting to order <coughs> you're out of order <coughs> who's going to pray for lunch that type of thing um the job has evolved a little hasn't it Yes, yeah, so it basically we can uh, blame John Allen and uh, the 70s and 80s, Frank, uh, Ed Browning, and to turn it from a gavel banging job mm -hmm. into the expansion of the authority of General Convention. So now it's essentially a full time job, but it's unpaid. Well, last General Convention, there was a push to have the presiding president of the House of Deputies given a salary, plus a staff, plus an expense account, plus basically to give her financially the same status the presiding bishop has mm. and effectively making her co-primate you notice every so often that uh, when they release statements on issues it'll be uh signed by both michael curry and by gay jennings because she insists because she's head of the house of deputies she's got to sign it too okay yeah you may tease but she's got some power you remember stacy Sauls, right yes indeed he crossed her and look at where he is now Stacy Sauls uh, fought in the in the House of Bishops against this proposal. Fought against making paying the pr president of the House of Deputies in the back corridors and power meetings of eight fifteen. And as soon as Catherine Jeffrey Shorey was out the door, and there was a vacuum because Michael Curry didn't you know know yeah. the this lay of the land. In comes Gay Jennings, and the well is poisoned, and Stacy Sauls out in his ear. Now there's plenty of reason to fire him. And why it wasn't done under Catherine Jeffrey Shorey, if, if all the things said about him were true, I don't know. But it was Gay Jennings who revenge was the uh, on the menu that day. Yes, <laughs> she did it well. That silly little tape recorder under the chair. <laughs> well, what happened? Well, the House of Bishops meeting, usually they go over 
anodyne stuff, and we had, and plus there's a theme, and this time around they met at Camp Allen in Navasota, Texas, and they finished up on March 9th. This meeting, unlike previous meetings before General Convention, was only five days long instead of ten days. And those five days, there's probably only about three days worth of actual time to do business, because they have presentations and whatnot. And they, at the beginning, they turned out the normal sort of anodyne stuff. We had a statement about gun violence, a statement about sexual harassment, stuff I'll get around to posting if I've not done it, or maybe I'll never do it on Anglican Inc. Nobody cares about this stuff, but they're nice. But then they spent two solid days on two issues, mm -hmm. the House of Deputies president and prayer book revision. Now, Kevin, how do we know what we think we know? How do you think we know all this stuff? Okay, well, here's the thing. Back in 2006 or seven, I don't remember the exact date, I started Anglican TV, a video ministry, because we don't have to have any more blog ministries because every bishop blogged. Well, not all of them, mm -hmm. but the bishops you wanted to know their opinion on, they, they either blogged or they knew a blogger. And uh, Dan Martin's blogged, uh, who, you know, I, I can't go through the whole list. Ed, Ed Salmon had an indirect blog. An indirect blog, uh, <clears throat> a T1-niner. And uh, so you, you, just, you just had the information of what happened, what the bishop thought, and what he was going to do about it every night. You know, and you had it all, both on the liberal side too. Yeah. You had both sides. Everybody was talking and blogging and everything. We still have a couple uh, blogger bishops. So George and I have to go and read those blogs, read between the lines of what the blog says, and then get confirmation about what we're reading. And so something that happened uh, two or three weeks ago is about the soonest we can deliver the news. Whereas in 2006, 2007, we could tell you that night by reading the blogs. So we, we have uh, come across and compiled some information. Um, none of it's hearsay, okay. but all sources have been confirmed. Let me explain why we've, we're no longer at that point. Yeah. Well, first off, under Catherine Jefford Shorey, Kevin, I, you know, God strike me dead, but I am a hypocrite because I, for years, I had nothing good to say about Frank Griswold. And then Catherine Jeffrey Shorey came along, and Catherine Jeffrey, Frank Griswold, the Episcopal Church under his leadership was steady, level. Thing he turned a prophet. Ah, then we had Catherine Jeffrey Shorey. She wanted information. Mm -hmm. She wanted to control information, and we had this move of at executive council and at the house of bishops meetings to make things private no conversations no cameras no recordings this and that and michael curry has sort of inherited that tradition this past meeting for instance the staff said no photos during the session unless you have the permission of all the people in the photo on the photographs wow. as if these are kids you can't put from a sunday school you can't put their pictures on facebook until you get mommy's permission so the official Catherine Jeffrey Shorey shell uh, barrier of information is still there, but they're cracks. And the second, nobody really cares anymore. No. Uh, nobody really, I mean, 2006, 7, 8, after a meeting, I'd be on the phone. Just, I had, you know, Bob Duncan and uh, John Howe and uh, you go on and on and on number on the speed dial or whatever the equivalent is in a cell phone. And they'd tell me what was going on. Now, I don't really care what's going on, uh, because what they say is not important, except these things. Yeah, well, these, these things are pretty big because of the ramifications. So, the gay, so here's a push mm -hmm. from the liberal supporters of Gay Jennings and the House of Bishops saying, and it's coming out of the House of Deputies. This is being driven by the House of Deputies who are demanding parity and power and prestige to the presiding bishop's office for their for their guy at the top. Mm -hmm. And these these present these were presented, they were discussed and then the bishops broke into indaba groups. Oh. Where they sit in circles of 20 people. How do you feel about that? How do you feel about that? And you're not allowed to tell anybody outside of the Adaba group how you feel. Well, they do. <laughs> they do tell me. Of course they do. <laughs> they talk amongst themselves. They talk to journalists they trust. They lie to journalists they don't trust. Mm -hmm. 
And the take for the House of the majority of the House of Bishops was that this is a this is the Episcopal Church, not the Committee Church. Yeah. We can't, you know, there's a there's some theology here. Yes, I know people will laugh when theological issues are raised as an objection in the Episcopal Church. But yes, they're theological issues. A president, a deputy to general convention does not hold that same office or status or authority as someone, a man or woman who's consecrated as a bishop. And to put them on par with each other is just a theological error and an ecclesiological error. Well, no, and, so but the, the left and the right are against this, and they just they don't want to spend the money, they don't want to empower another level of bureaucracy, and they don't like being pushed around by the House of Deputies. But if you remember, you know, five years ago, Catherine and Bonnie had the same issue. There was, you know, times that they came up against each other and disagreed on the way forward for the Episcopal Church. And do you remember what Catherine Jeffrey Shorty did to Bonnie, uh, Bonnie Anderson? Mm-hmm. She ran her out of town That's on a right. rail. Boom! How dare you? And that and and Gay Jennings, her Catherine Jeffrey Shorty ally, took the, the took the post. So you you know you cross some of these passive aggressive powerful women at your own peril. Well, so that 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 was major discussion, and then they moved into prayer book revision. Mm. Now this is not the sort of if you were a priest you had to take a liturgy class and you slept through it because it was so tedious you know why do we do the emphasis here this and that awesome. this is not what we're talking about that sort of prayer vision no your, your average bishop is kind of up on the filicoi but that's about it ah uh, so yeah they said yeah. and prayer book revisions I, nobody's been happy with the prayer book the 1979 prayer book bloggers have become famous peter toon was famous for his opposition to uh, the 1979 and many others but uh, it's interesting because when they say we need to do some, res- you know, a couple revisions, they indicate that it's just a comma here and a semicolon there. What actually happens is when you show up, they have already pre-printed pages of what their real suggestions are. And this upcoming revision, I'm going to say, is going to be about gay marriage, George. Kevin, why would you suppose that? <laughs> well, we've had trials. The trials have worked just fine, except for one thing. You can't make a bishop do it. Right. Mm. That last general convention, they came to an accommodation. The, uh, commission, uh, the Committee on Prayer Book and Liturgy put forward these trial rights for gay marriage. And if it's a, as it's a trial right, you cannot compel a bishop to use it. A bishop can say, ah, oh, sorry. And... The, and the accommodation that was hammered out to keep the Episcopal Church from falling apart, again, was that places that want to use gay marriage can use gay marriage. But within those dioceses, conservatives who do not want to perform gay marriages cannot be compelled to perform gay marriages. They have their own personal conscience to opt out. Now, the bishop can make their life difficult, say, if you refuse, you have to find a replacement. Mm-hmm. But in the Diocese of Newark, I don't think you have to go too yeah, many letters not, down the phone book yeah. to find somebody. However, in Dallas and Central Florida and Albany and the Diocese of Florida in Jacksonville and Diocese of Southwest Florida in Tampa and all, so on and so on, the gay marriage is not permitted. The trial youth's rights are not used. Nor can the few liberal congregations ask for flying bishop or alternative oversight if the bishop's not willing. Central Florida, we have one dot parish, uh, St. Richard's, that has pushed for uh, gay marriage rights permission. And the bishop has been quite clear, and the standing committee, and everybody's quite clear that, no, you may not do it. No, you may not allow your building to be used. No, if you're a priest of this diocese, you cannot do it at the Disney non-denominational chapel. Uh, nothing to do with the Episcopal Church. Now, if somebody wants to import somebody from out of state, do it at the Disney chapel to do a gay wedding, that's fine, nothing to do with us. And so the conservatives basically can live with that by turning it from a trial right to an addition to the prayer book, that takes away the bishop's right because if it's in the Book of Common Prayer, a priest can use it any time, any place, anywhere. A priest can still refuse a parishioner's request to have a gay wedding, but the priest cannot, uh, or the bishop cannot refuse the priest. Yeah, that Not sounds close enough. I, but, <laughs> but remember, Kevin, these, these, these things are all incremental. Right. Uh, I, I'm fairly, you know, the conscience clause on women's orders is taken away and things like that as well. So give it time. 
But this, but here's the thing: the bishops discussed this, and it's fascinating how it broke out in the comments. Now, Bishop Dan Martins of Springfield posted something about this on his web blog, in his web blog, so we can quote him by name. Everybody else, we have to be quiet about. But what what we got from other people was that there seemed to be a third, a third, a third split here. There is. There are a third who are still the old-time liberal ideologues. I'll name some names who are no longer around, but uh, Jack Spong, Catherine Roskam, Charles Benison, who for ideological purposes must be done as a matter of justice. Mm -hmm. That's a quarter to a third. And then there's another quarter to a third, maybe 40%, who basically, well, we'll go along with this, but we do not want to have a fight. Yeah, I mean, if you do not want to if drive you, out the remaining third, sure. push them out the door. And Dan Martin's on his blog said that 2003 was an earthquake. If they pass this, this is, they're going to be just as catastrophic, his word, catastrophic aftershocks. Mm -hmm. Now, did Dan Martin say out loud that Springfield and other dioceses would walk? No, oh. he did not. But. It would be a repeat of Gene Robinson. Somebody's walking. If you're comparing it with Gene Robinson, you're comparing that sort of thing now. What, mm. And the majority, I would say right now, look, things have settled down. The presiding bishop is a decent guy. He's allowing you live and let live. We're over the past, and there's some people who want to refight the past because they're ideologues and they're power crazy. And the Episcopal Church, uh, I know it's an ongoing running joke, but the Episcopal Church is on the verge of collapse. Spain. I don't know this baby yet. I don't know. <laughs> no. Well, I want to contrast this in terms of lex orende, lex credende. Um, you are what you pray. Uh, and, and so does this not, right. does this not uh, become an official teaching of the Episcopal Church? Oh, absolutely. When you change the prayer book, you change the doctrine of the Episcopal Church. Mm -hmm. Our doctrine is set out by the prayer book and the 39 articles and the homilies mm -hmm. and when you change their prayer book essentially what you're saying is that this is the official formal teaching of the Episcopal Church and that is the if you will the line that uh, uh, can't be crossed by uh, uh, conservatives in the Episcopal Church at this point because up to this point we can have uh, because the Episcopal Church is semi-congregational always has the highest uh, body is the local diocese, mm -hmm. not the national church. We all use the same prayer book, but we have a prayer book that is flexible enough to allow kooks here and flat earth crocodites there to all use it. If we're changing the text from which we're working, you're changing it to basically exclude or make political points. So as though some may not think the 79 prayer book is ideal, because actually at the time it was considered to be really Anglo-Catholic. You had conservative evangelicals like Peter Toon, whom you mentioned, object to it. It's just changing the doctrine and discipline. That argument really didn't sell well. But when you have overt gay marriage rights, you can't disguise that. Because I remember Justin Welby saying, you know, we're going to look into this type of stuff, but it's not in our prayer book. We, it just doesn't, you know, it, it's not official. And this is this this is the jump to official if it happens. Well, Gavin Ashenden is doing review of Justin Welby's new book, oh. and hopefully he'll be able to tell us what what Welby says. But I have read the Spectator, the British magazine, mm -hmm. reports that in, in its reading of the advanced copy, Welby has uh, come out basically for gay marriage. So we'll see. I mean, I want to hear what Gavin has to say. He's smarter than I am. Yeah, I've seen expert uh, excerpts, and yeah, he does. Um, uh, you know, if you love someone, pff, come on. Now, you mentioned early on uh, the you know how good Frank Griswold was uh, compared to other ones. Uh, Michael Curry is a variable in all this. Obviously, Catherine Jeffrey Shorey would have been a leader down this road for new uh, gay rights and marriage rights within the prayer book. Um, Michael Curry, as a minority, likes to defend minorities. Where, do, where do you think he's going to come in here? Well, we're, we're dealing with personalities. Catherine Jeffrey Shorey, at heart, was an insecure person. Mm -hmm. 
she knew that people questioned her faith that she knew people questioned her competence because she had no resume to run on this is you know there was all this talk about how she had inflated her resume and false things and so she was very defensive and she surrounded herself with people who shared her ideology and sort of wound her up so one of the reasons why we have these lawsuits I believe and this is my opinion is that her chancellor his law firm was given the business to pursue these lawsuits and so he profited uh, this, you know Alan Haley has written about this extensively that there was a vested interest by the Chancellor David Booth Beers to engage in the lawsuits because he profited by the profits generated for his law firm Michael Curry is not that insecure Michael Curry is very sure of himself he's had a long hard fault road he's of the generation that in other words he rose in his merits he's not a token appointment by anything and as you say because of the african-american experience he's always had a soft spot for minorities and a generation past that was african-americans or then gays or women it's now it's conservatives mm. now you may snicker at that but you need to remember that when uh, frank griswold was presiding bishop keith ackerman was on the executive council and frank griswold protected keith ackerman frank griswold uh, Keith Ackerman, whose views on the ordination of women, sexually little, any of this stuff, were considered anathema by some of the liberals. Griswold protected him and supported him. Uh, it was Shorey who undid him. Shorey defrocked him, even though he said, saying, you've abandoned your ministry, even though Keith Ackerman wrote, I'm not abandoning my ministry. So Michael Curry still has that degree of authority, and right now Michael Curry is protecting the remaining conservatives. There no uh, well. There's one Anglo-Catholic conservative I'm aware of that's uh, Bill Love, but mm -hmm. the rest are evangelical or traditional conservative Episcopalians. Which, yeah, it's going to be interesting to watch the process uh, for people who want to know. We're not going to collect money for it yet, but we're sending George down uh, to General Convention next year to uh, to cover I'm it. Already polishing my pointy boots, and <laughs> I want to buy a hat when I'm down there. Good. I will not be going down there. Oh, General Convention just drives me crazy. And we will have a contest for the first journalist to post the transitional bathrooms, uh, the, the gender-neutral bathrooms. So that'd be fun. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger. And you have been watching episode 380 of right. Anglican Unscripted.